All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Apologies. We had some technical delays in the studio here. And I'll turn it over to Councilmember Stratton. Happy Monday, everyone. <clears throat> this is the, let's see, April 12th um, Urban Experience Committee meeting. Thanks to everyone for joining us. Um, before we get started, I wanted to ask everybody the question, how many of you know where to go to learn how to make a banana split? And the answer is Sunday school. Okay, so that's our happy Monday joke. And Lori, I think Councilmember Kinnear is going to pass out right now. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> let's start out. Um, approval of the minutes. Did folks have an opportunity to look at the minutes? And can I get a motion? Move to approve. Second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Any Aye. opposed? Aye. Our minutes passed. Um, looking at consent agenda items, there's quite a bit on here. Did anybody have questions on the briefing papers? Councilmember Mum. I always love hearing from Historic Preservation if she's here. Historic, I, is there anybody here from Historic Preservation? This is Chris Becker. Hi. Um, unfortunately, Megan could not be here uh, today. She had something she needed to attend to. Um, but if you have questions, if you want to email me, I can track down answers for you. Thank you, Chris. So any questions on that can go to um, Chris Becker. Any Anybody else? We should have Patrick, are you here? Patrick Stryker was going to be on the call um, for if you had questions on the COPS memo, but he is not. Okay. Um, I think what I'd like to do, if everybody is in agreement, we have Mark Richards here from the DSP to do a quick update, and we also have Melissa Huggins here from the Spokane Arts. Can Sorry, Karen, I, I am here. It just took me a minute oh, to figure okay. out how to unmute myself and uh, get the camera on, but I, I did it, so I'm here. You made it. Interested. Yay. You missed my joke. No, I caught it. Sunday school. It's the best. <laughs> okay. So, Patrick, I'm going to have you spend just like one or two minutes to talk about that memo between um, COPS and the city. <clears throat> yeah, so we had an MOU that uh, Brian and I had been working on that makes use of, I think it's the, the traffic funds in the school area uh, and making sure those funds come back to things that keep kids safe. And so our volunteers have been working pretty diligently for well over a year now to uh, get out into those areas and um, whether it's assessing the school routes for uh, potential issues and safety things for kids, uh, working with the NROs if there's uh, drug houses or other concerns that are on those areas that kids are walking past. Uh, we've got volunteers in marked vehicles sitting at intersections that uh, crossing guards have let us know are particularly problematic to speeders and things like that. Uh, and so having a really strong presence out there in the school zones, we're in conversation with all the presidents at the elementary, or excuse me, principals uh, at the elementary schools and making sure they know we're here. Um, and so it's been, been a really, really good thing just getting out there and, and hoping to do some good things with volunteers to keep kids safe, to be able to walk to and from school. Perfect. And I will add that this was an agreement that actually we started talking about about a year and a half ago. At least, so we yeah. Just, yeah. yeah, we just got everything put together, but I thought that was good for council to hear um, yeah. that there is some enhanced protections for kids in those um, school uh, school routes. Yeah, That's it's important. a great thing when you get, um, especially parents of kids and reaching out to them to become volunteers because they have a vested interest in, uh, yeah, really working closely with the schools and crossing guards and hearing firsthand what, what's going on that we need to be aware of. So it's been a great, great thing for us and for the kids. Okay, okay. Does anybody have any quick questions for Patrick? Okay, I just wanted to make that information available to everyone. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you. So moving along, does anybody have a problem if we move up, if we listen to Mark and Melissa now so we can get them on their way to their day? No, no issue. Council, Council Member Cathcart has a question. Oh, yes, I'm yeah, sorry. I just, no, that's okay. I, I sent an email earlier asking if we could pull Q the uh, source of income off of the uh, briefing, and I just wasn't sure if that oh, got I caught or not. I didn't get that, but Brian McClatchy, are you available? We, 
Can oh. I, I think the council president had a few uh, preparatory yeah. notes. Uh, we okay. we can do it, That's but let's minute. let's do it after we hear from uh, Mark Mark Richard and and Melissa, so that they can go. But I'll talk after that. Okay, thank you. So I'm going to introduce a man who needs no introduction. Mark Richard, we all know you. It's good to see your face today. And we are looking forward to an update from you on the downtown um, improvement district and all the activities that are going on and all the good work you're doing. Take it away. Great. Thank you very much, Councilwoman and Council members. I greatly appreciate it. Uh, my mom would uh, not be happy with me for not being able to jump in and, and allow Melissa to go first because that's the way I was raised. Uh, but uh, since you called on me, I will respond. So uh, Elizabeth is going to be managing the slide deck and we'll try to move through this fairly quickly and then leave time for questions. Uh, so uh, in light, we've got a quarter to cover with you in less than 10 minutes. We'll just get right to it. So uh, first off, just want to let you know we are uh, spring has sprung, uh, so you probably noticed the tulips are starting to, to bloom. Those We plant those early in the year, and then they start to bloom, and then we trade those out for our, our uh, annual flowers. And uh, we'll start to plant those starting the 18th of May. Um, we'll, we'll start in the west end of downtown on the 18th, and then we'll move into the downtown proper on the 19th of May. And then oh, I guess the, uh, the north bank will be on May 12th. So uh, we have those kind of broken into three quadrants. Uh, for our spring plantings. I can't remember, I lost count, but I want to say close to 150 different planting uh, planters that we plant in now. Uh, so that's exciting. So next slide. Uh, so thanks uh, in part to your team. Uh, we are busy. We've already launched with our uh, kind of our annual spring. When things thaw out a little bit, we are able to move out and mobilize with our gator and with our pressurizer equipment. So we're starting to do sterilization and pressure washing in all of the railroad under viaducts. Uh, and uh, we are also continue to work with some of the partners in that regard. So uh, Catholic Charity, CityGate, Burlington Northern, and one of our biggest partners, of course, is your code enforcement department, which we could not do this without, So we're, and law enforcement. So SPD joins us so that we can uh, kind of ask folks to either step out or move out while we clean uh, in those railroad viaducts, so we're grateful for that. And then we also kind of gave our annual report to city staff with regards to the big gullies. We go around, take an assessment on how, what kind of condition they're in. We try to clean up, obviously, on a regular basis, the graffiti and so forth, but then also just letting your team know which of those big bellies uh, need repairs. Um, but in general, those are working fantastic. Um, so again, thanks to the city. Move to the next slide, if you would. So next up is uh, we always love, uh, you know, sans COVID. Uh, we usually have a great spring cleaning week that we launch in downtown, and we're anxious to get back to that this year. So this year we have scheduled for April 19th through the 21st. Uh, that is, again, sponsored by Republic Services, who I know is one of your partners. Uh, so we're grateful for that sponsorship. And if folks are interested in signing up to join us, we usually get um, a, a great, you know, somewhere between 50 and 100 participants every year. Uh, people can look uh, at our calendar at downtownspokane.org and consider signing up for joining us for Spring Clean Week. Next slide. Uh, one of the things that I know you've experienced this, I know the whole country is experiencing this, but certainly because of some of the challenges with COVID and then also some of the positive signs with some of our new employers, Amazon, et cetera, uh, we, we are experiencing a little bit of our own in employment crunch. <clears throat> and so we, um, uh, we do have some employees that have left for some of those other employment opportunities. Uh, we, so I just wanna uh, make sure I share this wherever we go. We have two seasonal and one permanent clean team position open. And then we also have our supervisor of our clean team position. Uh, Karen, after really helping us to turn that department around, is retiring, unfortunately, in the uh, middle of May. And so we're in need of a, of a good lead there, if anybody knows of somebody. Uh, and we've been advertising, uh, you know, at a variety of different places, both with Craigslist, WorkSource. Uh, we've, we also interact. We went and toured and visited with our friends at Pier. And, uh, and then we also, uh, with transitions, and, and then we marketed it at, on the, uh, the Black Lens um, magazine as well. Um, so we're trying to make sure that we are 
you know, doing our part to be part of the solution in terms of raising folks up that might be coming out of recovery, but then also walking the walking the talk in terms of doing a better job of making sure that uh, community people of people of color know that we are accessible. In fact, we're ecstatic uh, if you would consider employment with the DSP and the bid. So next slide. Uh, our, uh, well, I would just, I would just uh, also let you know these are, these are, this is an old slide deck, unfortunately, um, because, uh, and so you'll notice nobody's wearing masks, and so I better, I better just qualify that right up front, or nearly up front. Um, but uh, so this is a good example. Our team is engaging on a regular basis as, as permits. Now we're doing it on uh, via Zoom, but we're meeting on a regular basis with SNAP, Community Court, and other service providers, as well as the, uh, uh, the homeless teams. And um, we are um, working with the police department as well as code enforcement, as I mentioned, on a weekly basis. Uh, also just remind all of you as council members, we, one of our tasks that you adopted in our management plan is we are just beginning the dialogue internally about what does the future of our ambassadors uh, look like? Uh, do we keep our limited commissions? Do we change our attire? Do we change our approach and all of those things? And so you will be involved in those conversations, but I just want to let you know that uh, that's certainly a discussion that we've begun internally to start. And then uh, the ambassadors, I also just point out that they engage in uh, things, everything from uh, trying to articulate a good place to go meet to um, last week, they helped a, a gentleman fix a flat tire. Uh, of course, we respond to calls. We unfortunately had to respond to a call uh, uh, made by another security team, which we then responded and helped to detain an individual. And so our team does just that. They run that gamut, everything from customer service to, to providing security in downtown. And we, we attempt very hard to do that in a holistic manner. So um, the, uh, one, of the, one of the things we've just changed is we now have our ambassadors entering our data into their input system. So we're collecting data in terms of what types of activities they're involved with, uh, now we're collecting that on a daily basis as they check out for the day. Um, uh, and so year to date, our ambassadors have already made 2,815 business contacts and assisted um, citizens 1,785 times already in this first quarter. Uh, so that's pretty exciting and pretty impressive. And then also just to point out, uh, I know you're probably aware of this, but the comp stats that we get from the police department show uh, that you know, overall, uh, just like in the rest of the city, crime continues to go downward. Um, violent crimes, in particular, are down. However, we uh, we continue to have a slight, uh, excuse me, violent crimes are slightly up uh, in downtown, but property crimes uh, continue a downward trend, which is very positive. So next slide. So this month, we actually participated in a walk along, and we're going to do a couple more of those with one of our board members from the Business Improvement District. In fact, we would welcome any of our board members or you, for a matter of fact, um, if you had an interest in doing a walk along with our ambassadors or our clean team to get a firsthand kind of experience of how they work. Um, we also are working on a bit of an initiative, came at a request of a couple of our members, and that is that we were doing some septet analysis of our Skywalk system to look at uh, outlets and then just look at make, uh, make kind of those points of concern where we might have for security purposes. And then we continue to promote the SEPCHED program in general. So shifting course a little bit, um, as we promised to you last year and was in our management plan, we have just entered a contract after looking at a couple of different uh, options from um, different individuals that we interviewed and discussed things with. We've we're excited about um, just signing a contract with Dr. Sherry Clark. Uh, Dr. Clark is the, um, uh, she's the uh, Vice President of Diversity for Eastern Washington University. And not only is she gonna work with both of our boards through training uh, one, once a month for four month training exercise, but then also, as I keep sharing, one of the things I'm most excited about is her helping us with this internal cultural audit to really look at how we interface and, and uh, how we look to the, to the outside world in terms of our language, our wording, our hiring practices, our website, all of those good things. And so um, she comes highly recommended and we're again, uh, very optimistic about working with her. And that will start, uh, let's see, I should have the exact date, I don't have it on me, but it's a mid, I'll say in another week or two uh, is when we start that first meeting with Dr. Clark. 
right. Uh, next slide. So in 2021, we've been focusing and highlighting entrepreneur owners and organizations. And as again, as promised uh, through our management plan, we, we've started off this year with doing some uh, really robust marketing of minority-owned businesses. And then we went right into um, uh, marketing uh, women-owned businesses. And then um, Liz, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's, uh, I think, family-friendly. family, family friendly, Is that right? I don't know if she's on the mic or not, uh, but um, correct. Yes, family-friendly okay. businesses for April. Yes. Okay. Good. So, um, so that's so we've um, made some good progress so far there, and I think uh, so far we've done. I think it is 20 uh, downtown businesses via our online interview and uh, projecting those stories out to the community. That seems to be received very well. Next slide. So you might not recall that uh, because a lot of detail in our management plan, but one of the things that we we uh, promoted is the fact that we, because we were able to, even in the midst of COVID uh, with reduced revenues, we we were extremely frugal and we managed to, um, to come in ahead of budget last year. We put forward about $30,000 specifically towards uh, expanding our cultural opportunities in downtown that celebrate individuals of color and communities of color. And so, uh, Liz has just received approval from the VIA Advisory Board and then the VSP Board, where we will be launching a grant program that will be available starting in June, and that will be up to $5,000 per recipient, and that will go towards uh, entities, uh, whether they be existing or new, that are looking to uh, host or to expand an event that celebrates our unique culture and community in the downtown area in this coming year. So. And our goal is uh, is to try to create a fund raising mechanism where we can then perpetuate that uh, involvement and that investment on an annual basis going forward. Next slide. Uh, let's see. So we are coming to the end of our three-year MOU with the city where we have designated Wall Street as a uh, specific venue for events. And uh, you have worked with us and your staff has worked with us to develop some parameters that allows us to expedite the delivery of those events. And of course we meet certain criteria and we have insurance and indemnity clauses and all of those great things. Uh, but we are working on uh, that uh, extension of that three year MOU that will allow us to do some things that we're excited to bring back. And I'm sure the community is food truck Fridays, uh, kid culture Saturdays, a kid club Saturdays and then the Sunday Art Mart among, uh, among a few. Uh, and then in addition, we're working with Spokane Arts and some other partners, including some private interest on stretching out this investment in our alleyways, uh, uh, starting with, uh, well, I shouldn't say starting with, because it's still stalled out. And that's the section that uh, Councilwoman Kinnear helped us with going back a year before last. And that's that stretch of alleyway between Wall and Howard, uh, where we got part of the way and then uh, a variety of things hit from one uncooperative building owner to uh, another property being purchased and now it's been shut down for construction for the last year. And um, however, we're looking at uh, the stretch essentially from Post over to, Mon to Lincoln as another alleyway we're working on and then, and then from Stevens to Washington going the other direction and um, uh, engaged with, uh, like I said, private property owners as well as with the city administration, uh, maybe looking at resurfacing of a stretch of alleyway over there to the east, and and then just how do we deliver, you know, entertaining, exciting, uh, interesting places where people want to come and uh, that help drive again culture and commerce. Mark, can I interrupt just right. for a second? Spring has sprung. How are we doing for time? Mark, let's. Go a couple more minutes, uh, Council President Beggs. Do you have I, a question? Yeah, just on this section, Mark. Um, so, in about a little less than a year, we're going to be able to open up Spokane Falls Boulevard out in front of the new library. And the plan was to close that off on uh, weekends during the summer and do programming in there. I'm just wondering, I know it's a little ahead of time, but have your team uh, been thinking at all about that? Well, Liz could chime in. I know that I have not. Oh, wow. Um, the, so the, are, are you hoping that we would help you program or just making sure that we're aware and communicating the closure or both? 
Well, no, I'm hope uh, really both, but mostly on the programming end. Again, it's not in your current okay. MOU or anything like that, but I'm just uh, wondering what, as you're thinking of these kind of programming issues, that's going to be available in about a year. And so I'm just, I guess I'm maybe putting a bug in your ear to think about that. So. Can I jump in? Please, please. Um, it is my understanding that the library um, staff at the downtown library have had a very vested interest in programming that space. Um, but on behalf of the programming team at downtown, we, w we have worked with them on different occasions. In fact, we purchased some sound equipment for them a few years ago. So I would happily entertain um, sort of a co-programming opportunity along Spokane Falls there. Great. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, we'll, we'll make sure to reach out to Andrew and start that dialogue in a little bit more um, intentional way, but that's exciting. Um, Liz also mentioned to me, uh, you know, we with, with the parquet changing hands and now that's ownership has settled. We were now working very actively with them to look at how we could program that parquet plaza, which is something that has been held up because of that ownership conundrum. And so that's, uh, this will fit in nicely, uh, Council President. Great. Uh, so, so I'll try to just whip this through here on the uh, sp spring yeah. events. Mark, Mark, yes. I don't mean to interrupt, but I will. Um, the, go back, going back to Spokane Falls Boulevard, I think what Council President was also saying was, we are wanting it to be closed off to traffic so that entire stretch would be programmable, which is very different than just the plaza. Right. Yeah, I captured that. And uh, that's certainly something we'll engage with, uh, with you and then also obviously with the library and then the neighbors there so that we've got good transparency and communication going on. Uh, needless to say, we'll want that stretch of Lincoln open uh, before that occurs. Otherwise, we you know, we'd have a complete yeah, post closed. closed. We'd have a dead end there. Uh, but but um, yeah, I'd like to work with you through on the on some of the logistics of that. You know, because it's if my memory serves, are we converting Lincoln back? Are we going back to a one way going southbound on that short stretch of Lincoln? So it'd be two lanes going south or just one. I, I don't remember. Do you remember, Council President? I think it's uh, two way on Lincoln. So two way, okay. Um, but you just you have so a free. We'll you have take a right. Traffic challenges that, that we'll want to work through if we were if we're you know brought down to one one lane there. But um, I'm sure it can be done. So um, yeah, we'll work with you on it. Sorry, this is Candace. I want to jump in too. Yeah, if I may. Hi. Hey, have you had a chance to engage with the new player, Tavolata, that new restaurant? Um, because you've got that key corner there um, that could wrap around to Riverfront Park. And it just has always dawned on me that that would be so great to have some outdoor seating, dining, interaction there. Interaction there. I can answer that one. <laughs> um, Yes, they reached out to us uh, about a month ago. Um, they uh, were trying to expedite. They have put in for a permit on the north side of Old City Hall where there was previously a patio. Um, so we're working with them. Um, I'm also engaging with their management um, to get them prepared for when we do start to program Wall Street so that any programming that happens is also beneficial to them as a tenant in downtown. Yeah, and Councilwoman, apparently they were struggling a little bit maybe with the timing on getting the patio permit. Uh, so if it's okay with you, I might, I might loop back with them, see how that's going. And if we're still bumping into some challenges, uh, maybe maybe uh, lean on you a little bit if we need some help. Well, Chris Becker's on this call, and I know that the mayor's committed to um, making sure we take care of all the restaurants that need this. So, I, And Council's behind that. So Great, great. Okay, well, we'll reach out to Chris then. Thank you. Okay. Any other uh, questions at this point? Okay, Mark, I'll give you some extra time to finish up. Okay, I'll, I'll try to like maybe one or two minutes max here. So we've got Spring Scramble. Uh, we've got uh, some gift card giveaways, and we, we're working with the Isaac Foundation uh, Partnership helping coordinate uh, some work that they're doing to promote autism uh, and then we'll, uh, for the Spring Scramble series. And then we've got a 30-minute 30, 30 series we launched 
during COVID. And this, this month, we've got um, ED Rice Hour talking to us about transitions, but uh, primarily about child care. Next slide. Uh, we are uh, moving towards the completion of the public process on the downtown plan. And we look forward to working with you soon on uh, the adoption of that plan. Uh, just want to let you know that the most recent kind of final, if you will, public survey continues to show uh, some interest in making sure that we address the challenges around homelessness and public safety in the plan that, that have been raised throughout the process. And I recognize that's a sensitive uh, set of challenging issues, but would like to work with council just to make sure that we can do that in a holistic way again. Next slide. Uh, we've been out uh, promoting the discussion around our economic development function about the, the attributes and benefits of a downtown stadium. Next slide. We uh, have offered and clarified we're offering a, 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 a educational kind of viewing of a one of the local zip line parks uh, that is not a full access to the park. It's really the intention for those of you at council that still have unmet questions uh, in terms of being able to see actually how that runs and then what, what kind of the ambiance and the energy that's created out of a, out of a zip line adventure should we move forward. And we've also been able to secure a couple of new endorsements, one from Greenstone Homes and then one from Kimball Yards Business Association. And you've heard some of the others, but we fortunate to receive endorsements from Riverside, Peaceful Valley, Business Spokane, and Avista, and the Hotel Motel Association. Next slide. We've got a couple openings of our own that the PAC is looking at, the park, excuse me, the Business Improvement District is looking to fill on the Parking Advisory Committee. And then I believe uh, the council will have one or two as well that will be coming up for appointment as we look to, um, to fill out some of those vacancies that have been um, there for a while as we kind of re-energize the parking advisory committee. Thanks to you. Next slide. Uh, let's see. So we in, we are in the process of putting together white paper to respond to the mayor's initial response to our request to engage in a dialogue with all of you about the formation of a tax increment finance district. And then we're also meeting with our counterparts with Visit Spokane GSI, Spokane Valley, West Plains Chamber, on uh, what kinds of things that we see that, might, uh, that were successful during the last CARES Act funding and uh, what kinds of ideas or uh, initiatives we might share with you and our county counterparts as you begin to review uh, possible investments of those funds. And lastly, um, let's see, just wanna mention that we uh, are completely, yeah, no, that's a slide I wanted. Humbled, I think is, is too, um, small of a word, frankly, is that amidst all of this and what people are going through is the fact that as of year to date, uh, our, our businesses and, and property owners have already um, put forth about a little over a million dollars worth of the $1.4 million anticipated revenue from the Business Improvement District Assessment. Like I said, completely humbling given what they are dealing with right now and uh, keeps us uh, committed to doing everything we possibly can to help them out of this uh, pandemic. So. With that, I'll take questions. Anybody have questions? I can't see everybody, so if you have questions, just oh. speak up. Yeah, let's close that slide down, Liz, if you don't mind. Thank you. Councilmember Wilkerson. So just to follow up on the zip line, what has been our interaction with our tribal members since it is along the river? Great question, Councilwoman. Um, I have not been in most of those direct conversations, but my uh, understanding is John Moog has met with them uh, at least twice, if not more. Uh, when we initially met with one of the tribal council leaders down at Red Band Park, going back about a year ago, that conversation uh, was was positive, but uh, you know he did have a lot of questions. Uh, Mr. Abrahamson, and, and uh, my understanding is John's more recent interaction with the tribe they spoke in favor of the project and we're very grateful of the fact that we included them and would hope to be continued to be included. Uh, but I don't want to make any mistake in that. That's my recollection. And so I will, I will ask John to make sure to get some sort of an email out to all of you to capture their, their involvement and their response. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Cathcart and then Councilmember Mike. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Uh, I appreciate just the breadth of, of the stuff that you guys are working on. Um, 
you mentioned a, a wardrobe change for for ambassadors, and I'm just wondering, what would that mean? Getting rid of the the stab vests, and and I guess I'm wondering, is that at the request of of your ambassador staff, or is there just like a different way of of like a different type of protective gear you're you're thinking about that would be less um, obvious? Uh, just just kind of curious on the direction you guys are going. Yeah, great question. Uh, so I would just say, first of all, um, when I started here, I had our team take the word security off of our shirts, and we went to a polo and a very casual approach. Uh, it wasn't until about four or five years ago that the former mayor insisted we were not going to get any more law enforcement. At that time, I think we had seven, or maybe it was ten, and uh, that if we wanted <laughs> secure downtown, we were going to have to look more militant. Those were his words. Um, and so and so uh, when you combine that with the fact that we had very real growing security issues and my staff had come to me and said, you know, we are not feeling comfortable under the current environment uh, that combined those things together. And we ended up uh, investing in those vests, as you might recall. Um, I would say um, as we poll today, I think, I think we know that there are folks that have concerns about the look, especially wearing those vests and then wearing them outside their uniforms. We went with the outside the uniform vest because, uh, frankly, it had nothing to do with the look. It had everything to do with the fact that since we were going to be investing them, it allowed my team to be able to hang and carry all of their gear up on their chest uh, and around their core as opposed to along their belt, and, um, uh, which, is, which is what STA had gone through before we went that route uh, and describing. And, and I was experiencing my team had knee issues, hip issues, feet issues, and so on. Um, and so I would say... We want to keep an open mind. Uh, I want to make sure that we understand what our customers feel is appropriate. Uh, we, and, and those customers mean not only the existing businesses and property owners, but also our visitors. Uh, we want to make sure that we're providing the proper level of security. We want to have a good professional look. Uh, we don't want our appearance to be a deterrent. And, and, and yet at the same time, we want to make sure that my team is safe. So I don't really have any preconceived notion of where this will end up. Um, but I, I committed to, to uh, all of you because I know this has been a concern uh, as to somehow thinking that perhaps this was our initiative, that we wanted to look more militant or we wanted to give a more of, a, of an aggressive approach or look, and that is just not the case. Um, I, I really responded to my team saying they didn't feel safe and to the former administration who said, um, you know, you're going to need to step up and fill this void because it's a lot less expensive to hire security ambassadors than it is law enforcement officers. We all know there's big challenges with that uh, in that uh, my team, uh, even though they have limited commissions, frankly, they don't use most of that limited commission because ours is a unique job, right? We're not protecting one property. Um, we're on 80 square blocks up and down alleyways and down the street and so forth. And so it's a really complicated situation. And so if, if uh, you know, clearly we will work with Councilwoman uh, Stratton and Wilkerson but if there are others that have an interest in this, we would welcome that dialogue and to include you in this process. We're trying to find the right answer. How do, how do we keep my team safe? How do we put off a good brand? I want to be welcoming. Obviously, uh, we want folks to feel happy to be here. Um, but we also we have, some, we have some perception of safety issues that we have to deal with as well in terms of getting our employers to get their employees back to work. Thank you. Member Mom. Thanks. Hey, Mark, can you update yeah. us on the uh, how the zip line proposal would come through the process because it's got multiple jurisdictions? And then how many companies do you expect will be interested in the RFP? You know, I have to defer to John um, because he's been meeting with your building and planning staff or had been on the process. So I apologize, uh, Councilwoman. I don't have those answers. I'm not going to try to fake my way through that. I will get you the answer to that and because in terms of that question, and I will send it to all of you um, if that's okay. And uh, and then regards to the companies, I expect um, I, I expect at least two uh, that we will have, possibly three. Um, and that's that's I think both the one in Coeur d'Alene as well as the one in Liberty Lake. I think both of those vendors have an interest in bidding on this. And remember, that would be privately funded, privately operated, uh, and they have the understanding that it would also mean some sort of a revenue sharing back to the parks to help the parks department pay for the maintenance of that area of the park or of the utilities property. 
uh, and possibly three that I just learned of today, this morning, uh, of a contact that I just made on all things uh, of fly fishing, wherein he read my little piece in the Inlander, and we began to talk about um, the value of activating our waterway, and that he mentioned he had a contact uh, that, that is a major investor in zip lines around the country, so I'm anxious to get this information to him as well. So zip and fish, very interesting. Yeah, zip, zip and chip, zip and dip and sip. I don't. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and Councilmember Mum, if I could, this is Garrett too, just to clarify oh, too hey, on Garrett. a couple items. Um, one, two for Betsy. You know, we have had multiple interactions with with the the tribe on this proposal. To my knowledge, we don't have anything in writing though at this point with any for formal support. Um, two, around on the process, where we left it as city staff and with the park board and others is forming a working group that would be a combination of council, park board members, staff, and other stakeholders to identify the questions, concerns, and any framework around what an RFP would look like. And so that working group has not been established yet, so that would be the next step into that. Um, as far as city staff, we haven't had any interaction with any potential proposal or proposers for this, um, but that first step will be around creating that working group to identify the questions that we want answers to for the respondents to have back from an RFP process. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? All right. Mark and Liz, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for the information. And we look forward to getting information back from you on the questions that some of the council members had. Thank you for doing that. Thank you all very much. Have a gorgeous morning. You too. Thank you. Um, Melissa Huggins, are you out there somewhere? Yes, I'm here. All right. Melissa, I'm going to let you take over and you're going to talk about the Neighborhood Poetry Project, which I'm so excited about and I love, and the Saga Grants. Yes. And if you can do it in 10 minutes, that'd be great. Okay. I can okay. do it. I promise. <laughs> uh, thank you, everyone, for having me. So I will pull up um, a couple of slides here that I'll move through relatively quickly. And okay. So just wanted to recap, uh, I'll hit a couple of highlights. I won't, I won't move through every single grantee, but just wanted to hit a couple of highlights of our first round of grant making. As you know, uh, we do three rounds throughout the year and these grants are funded by a small portion of the admissions tax. Um, in the first round, we had over $252,000 in eligible requests. Um, and we were able to fund uh, ultimately about 75,000 of those. Um, and we anticipate there will be more requests in the second round. The second round is usually our, our heaviest round. So just to sort of set the context that it is a competitive process um, and we don't have uh, nearly as much funding as there are you know, great eligible projects. So I'll hit a couple of highlights. Um, many of you know that the Get Lit Book Festival is happening this week. Uh, it's actually kicking off today and they're holding the festival virtually. Uh, so they received a small grant from Saga that will help uh, cover some author fees and some of the uh, sign language interpreters and closed captioning. Uh, Spokane Youth Symphony received a small grant to help with uh, uh, essentially private lessons for the students who are accepted into the symphony. And this is sort of a common practice that most of the students, when they're accepted to the symphony, they're encouraged to take private lessons. But of course, not all the students who are talented and qualify for the symphony can afford those lessons. So the Saga Grant is going to help uh, assist with those. Um, outdoor musical theater uh, productions this summer with uh, COVID restrictions in place. And then, I apologize for my dog. Uh, and then um, we also awarded a small grant that will fund uh, uh, elementary school students at Garfield Elementary will be coached by two local professional muralists to create a mural um, in the Garland Art Alley that they will participate in designing and installing. Uh, some funding to Northwest Winterfest, which is of course a, a wide cultural celebration. Um, a small grant also to a project called Ponies in the Park. So this grant will fund a, uh, a children's book 
that will essentially highlight the public art that is located in Riverfront Park. And this will come with lesson plans and a website so that teachers and families can use it as a tool, um, you know, go do a scavenger hunt and find the artwork, um, that sort of thing. So lots of teaching opportunities in conjunction with the book. Uh, local author Kate Lebo, uh, who actually just released uh, a book that has been extremely well reviewed, um, has received funding for her second book. And uh, as many of you may know, Kate is heard of hearing. Um, her next book of essays will be uh, titled The Loud Proof Room. And part of the grant will fund her interactions with uh, the hard of hearing community and deaf community in Spokane. And then uh, just a couple more here. Um, also, uh, Imponda received a grant and they are a center for music and art therapy that's located in East Central. And um, they are very excited to use this grant to help um, youth and residents of the community kind of come into that space and be, have it be a community gathering space and also a learning space for music and art. And then uh, the Hispanic Professional Business Association, which of course puts on many community events throughout the year. Um, Dia de los Muertos celebration pictured here. And then also the German American Society received a small grant toward uh, hopefully being able to put on Oktoberfest this year and the Spokane Area uh, Council of Square Dancers. So that's just kind of, uh, again, some highlights of the grants that were awarded. And then I wanted to show one more slide here, and I'll bring this out. So this is a separate project that I just wanted to show you. Uh, Spokane Arts has partnered with Spokane Virtual Academy at Spokane Public Schools. And using um, grant funding that we received from the city, we were able to provide uh, a 1,000 creativity kits that um, were and are being distributed to K through six students um, as part of the Spokane Virtual Academy. So students picked them up um, during spring break in conjunction with the meal distribution. And then uh, students, who, students and families who didn't have transportation had the option to have their creativity kit delivered. So we partnered with Art Salvage who put together all of these wonderful kits which include art supplies, and supplies to uh, make a Wally style robot, which was in conjunction with a science lesson that the students were working on. So I wanted to hit that uh, quickly as well. Um, so any questions about either of those pieces? Okay, any questions? All right, we can move along. Okay, and then this is the tricky part. So. Uh, Karen had mentioned the In the Neighborhood uh, Poetry Project, and as many of you know, um, tons of community members have been participating in that project. We've been featuring the poems submitted on the website. There are poems from people of all ages. There are poems from almost every single neighborhood in Spokane, as well as many um, areas around the city. Uh, people of all ages, all backgrounds, all kinds of poetry, and as a kind of fun little celebration for uh, National Poetry Month, which is in April, our program manager, Micah Maloney, um, worked with some folks to put together a short video that features some of the poets. So I'm just going to play, if I can, um, the first four minutes of that video. See if I can do this here. Sorry, bear with me here. Okay, first time that I'm sharing video through WebEx, so thank you for your patience. Okay, so I will just share the first four minutes of this and give me, uh, maybe either Karen or Betsy, give me a thumbs up if you can hear the audio okay. Hi, I'm Chris Cook. Spokane's Poet Laureate. Spokane Arts and I have teamed up to create In the Neighborhood, a community poetry project designed to showcase the character and uniqueness of Spokane's neighborhoods. To see more poems from the project, please go to spokanepoetry.com. Hi, my name is Kaylee Hong and this is my poem, Tightropes and Turkeys and Trying and Trying and Trying. 
I walk the jagged rocks at the top of Cliff Drive like a balance beam, a tightrope. Impending doom is not death or broken bones, but the city below. Spokane, Spokane, how you haunt me and hold me. I walk the rocks one step at a time. Don't look down. I always look down. Heel toe, heel toe, heel toe. Sometimes it reeks of weed up here. Sometimes cigarette smoke streaming from cars loitering at the top of the hill. Other times wet dirt, fresh rain, the chalky smell of upturned gravel from a car peeling out of the place. Back down the hill is home for now, and I dodge turkeys and tree roots blistering through the sidewalk as I return. There's a little free library on my route back that I stop at, even though I already know its contents, already have it categorized, memorized. Short little mystery book, beat up bestseller, kids book, kids book, ratty cookbook. I tell myself I walk to make me love this place and it almost always works. I won't be here forever on earth in Spokane. But for now, this neighborhood is mine and I am the king of it and I love my people. The men who walk their dog show quality border collies and the pastel haired cashier at the grocery store and the man watching me twirl at the top of Cliff Park post run and the picnic goers and the ultimate frisbee enthusiasts and you and you and you and I'm trying to burn this place into my memory so I never forget it and I'm trying to hold it and make it sacred while I can and I'm trying to leave a mark or a sign or a signal that I was here, that I lived here, that I ruled here that I was this place and this place with me. So when I return here some five, 10, 15 years in the future, my neighborhood will open its arms and embrace me, kiss my head and say, remember that time when, do you recall? Let's go for a walk and welcome back. We missed you. I was born in the Holy Family, a hospital, a grandson to a pastor with the same name, Temple. I am an uncommon occurrence. A majority of the minorities are imports, not me. I'm an export of a city named after my favorite sport. Let's hoop. It's a town in the USA that every now and then will get a little play, a little zig, a little zag, a little recognition. A place that you can be at and get mentions, the Lilac City full of legends. And my hope is that the known and unknown will receive reverence and that it won't matter the color of the surface or how red the turf is, but that we all fly like an eagle. I am Spokane. I'm small with a big heart. Got love for the spoken art. I'm not the outdoorsy type but being creative by nature leads trails to a spark of an idea that I hope to bring to life with action, cameras, and lights. I am Spokane. So like I said, those were the first two readers um, from this longer video that we will release tomorrow, and I'll send you all the link. Um, I know they're so lovely. There are so many wonderful poems, and, and in the video we also have um, some really some very young community members, uh, an elementary school student. We have a student from the Salish school who recites his poem in both English and Salish. Um, so I will get that link out to you, and we'll be pushing it out to the community tomorrow. Um, and thank you for your support of the Poet Laureate Project, and thank you to Chris Cook for um, coming up with such a wonderful project. And I'm happy to field questions. Candace, Mum, Melissa, I'm just thinking we've got to get this on our city website. Um, yes. I don't know if you've been in touch with Brian Coddington. Yes, absolutely. I will, I will make sure to share with all of the people today. Thank you. And Melissa, 10 seconds, can you talk about the mural really quick for the cop shop? Yes, so we have a, a big slate of murals um, for this year. So super fast, we will have uh, a new mural on the center court at Riverfront Park, the new basketball court, um, the installation of the mural at uh, Thornton Murphy in the Lincoln Heights neighborhood, 
Um, we're working with the Cup Shop in Nevalwood to have a community mural on the side of their building, um, as Karen alluded to. And we're also working with the city to have some mini murals in the bike and scooter corrals. Um, and then there are about three or four other um, public murals that are on our slate for this year. And we also have um, a mural maintenance person who is going around right now, um, has been for the past couple of weeks, and is slowly working through any murals that got tagged over the winter. He is working on cleaning those up. Perfect. Thank you okay. for everything you do. We appreciate it. And that but that poetry is is just going to knock people out. I'm I'm so excited for it to be made public. So we'll look forward to that, Melissa. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for your time. Okay, we're going to go back up to count, uh, staff requests. Inga is going to talk um, about Fish Lake Trail. Inga, are you there? I am here. Take it over. All right. So I'm going to give you an update on Fish Lake Trail. Just um, as a refresher on the project overview, what we're trying to do is connect People's Park at uh, the Sandifer Bridge, which goes up the hill to the Centennial Trail. And we're trying to connect from there down to the existing Fish Lake Trailhead at Milton Street. So um, we've been working with a consulting firm for about the last year or so and came up with four different routes where they have done a lot of conceptual engineering work on that, including looking at geotechnical issues, cultural resources, um, bridges, walls, permitting, and also you know, talking with the public about which routes they would prefer. This, this project also includes figuring out how to make a connection up from Thorpe Road onto the Fish Lake Trail, which will um, you know, probably go with, with whatever route we pick, but will be part of the overall package eventually. So as part of the process, the consulting firm worked to come up with this scoring matrix, and they also worked with a stakeholder group to decide how they should be weighted, which is the column in orange here where it says weight one to five. And, um, and that same group also did, I believe, the user experience experience scoring part of it, and then the consulting firm did everything that was technical below it, um, which would be the environment, cultural resources, compliance, constructability, and cost. So I just want to summarize the four alternatives we looked at. Uh, the first one is the red, and, and I'm doing this in order of how well they scored um, on the, the matrix that you saw on the prior screen. So cost range on this um, is seven and a half to nine and a half million. This one basically follows government way um, with the exception of the northern part here, which kind of does some switchbacking through the corner of the dog park and then goes across Riverside Avenue and across a new bridge on Lake Tahoe Creek to connect into People's Park. It also has an option, this area that's shown in green where it has a dashed line to kind of veer the pathway away from government way and give it more of a park-like feel where you have some, uh, some probably some views up there and a little better access to the dog park at the top. Can I just briefly say I like that because there's a lot of speed along that way. That's where people wind up and go real fast is my experience. I, I should mention that part of this involves restriping government way from four lanes to three because we need to repurpose a little bit of that space to provide the buffer between the traffic lanes and the trail. The way it looks right now, if you go out there, there is an existing path, but it's right up against the street. And so the idea here would be to provide some separation, and we have to do that by changing the lanes. The blue one is the second most expensive, or sorry, second least expensive. And um, this one, we cross Laytaw Creek on the other side of Riverside Avenue. So you would start off with um, just an at-grade crossing of Riverside Avenue where it says number one here at the top. 
that have a new bridge across Lataw Creek and kind of wind through the park and climb up the hill. And about where you can kind of see like a yellow dashed line as you get down about halfway through the park, um, that's where we start seeing wall structures to be able to support the trail. And so this is where the cost really jumps up on this one is because we have to build a lot of walls and the soil is not terribly stable in that area. Um, we do go underneath the Sunset Boulevard Bridge, which is cool because you have a neat archway to go through there. And I should also mention that as you go through the park, there is some interaction with the existing disc golf course, which would have to be rerouted a little bit. Um, and we've talked with parks about this and it sounds like it's very doable. It's just a matter of, you know, rearranging some of the, the direction of where you throw. So this one does switch back up the hill here and brings you up between Sunset Boulevard Bridge and Interstate 90 and down 8th Avenue to tie into the trailhead. Purple um, is a similar route, except it goes, it has more switchbacks going down the hill between the bridges and actually goes underneath the Interstate 90 bridge in this version and then follows along the west side of Lataw Creek. Um, the biggest issue with this one, in addition to the, the walls, the wall cost goes up again on this one because there's more of them. Um, we're building underneath the Burlington Northern Bridge, which requires permitting with the railroad. And um, there are some concerns that WashDOT has with the I-90 bridge, and they need to do some evaluation on it and would not be willing to allow us to build anything under the I-90 bridge until they're done with that evaluation. And then even after that, we don't know for sure that we could. So this one is pretty much getting ruled out because of those constructability issues with WashDOT. The last option was the green route, which was similar to the purple, except that it just goes on the opposite side of the creek. And so it goes all the way down the east side and then crosses at the existing 11th Avenue bridge. Um, this one was pretty popular with the public. I think they, you know, they liked the, the feel of it. And, you know, a lot of people have walked or biked on that existing, it's a sewer access road that's there right now, that's gravel. And um, it also provides a really nice access to the neighborhood down there. But this one, um, requires walls, not just on the switchback side on the west side of the creek, but also on the east side, because in order to make the trail wide enough to meet our, our trail standards, we have to have walls to hold back the east side of the, the creek as well. And this one does have the same issues with building underneath I-90 that the, um, the purple route had. So these are the cost estimates in summary, um, cheapest to most expensive, the red and the blue were the, the least expensive. And then back to the, the evaluation outcomes from the matrix. So the consultant is, is pretty much done with their work on the first phase of this study. Um, the next part that they're supposed to go on to is we have money for them to do 30% design of whatever route we select with the intent to have that ready to go for potential grant applications when SRTC has the next call for projects, which would be spring of 2022. So we're, we're kind of targeting that. We'd like to get that done before probably, you know, December or January next year. So they were recommending the red alignment based on the way that the scoring worked out. Um, we also took this to the park board a month or two ago, and they agreed with, they were fine with either the red or the blue. And so the, the question that we kind of wanted to bring to you today is whether you think it's the, the right path to go out and talk to the public one more time before settling on most likely the red route. Um, and the reason we thought this might be a good idea is that the initial public outreach, you know, we were looking at four different routes. People had a lot of choice. I know some people probably, you know, fixated on the green route as their favorite and, you know, maybe didn't pay that much attention to the other ones. Um, and we also had a fairly, fairly small 
outreach of people, um, a small sample size. And so just wanting to make sure that we get out to the public and just get that final outreach effort before making a decision. So I just kind of want to verify with council that you think this is the right step. It will it will shorten our timeline a little bit to get the 30% design done of whichever one we end up with. Um, but do you think that's the, the right path forward? Councilmember Cathcart. Yeah, thanks for the presentation. Yeah, um, I was gonna make, make one comment that relates to your, your request there. So I, I had seen a couple weeks back, uh, several social media posts about some of the changes that were being proposed along the trail. And uh, I had one constituent reach out to me in particular uh, concerned that, that at least in one section of the trail, I think around Lindicky and, and um, Thorpe, that it was going to lose that trail feel and, and maybe have more of a, a bike lane type feel to it. And, uh, and I, I appreciate you'd responded back in with some information, but you said that there would be some future designs coming forward on that that might help inform what that's going to look and feel like. And so I guess, A, I'm just wondering wh where that stands right now, and then B, just in answer to your question, I think perhaps some additional outreach to, to some of those bicycle groups might be beneficial because it sounds like there was, there was a little bit of a, a shock to them, some of the changes that were coming, and so perhaps they weren't as aware of, of what was being proposed. Yeah, I, I think there probably is a little bit of confusion because we have two different projects going on at the same time, and that, that conversation was coming out of the 195 study that's being led by SRTC. And there is some overlap, definitely. And so it would be good for us to, to be able to clarify that. And, and are, are there updated designs for that area there around <laughs> not yet. Key and Thorpe that could be shared? Not, not yet. yet. Okay. There's not. Okay. Thank you. Council Member Mom? Hi. Yeah. I, I really love your scoring matrix, Inga. You always are such a leader in that area. Thank you. It's so helpful. And I love that the most popular one's also the cheapest. That's great. Um, but what I was going to mention was I'm seeing this go right through one of our designated centers that doesn't have a plan. And it also is crossing, I believe, what still is a highway, state highway. Is that right? Let me, um, let me scroll forward. It's old Sunset it's Highway. Sunset Highway is not a state designated highway anymore. It, oh, okay. Yeah, it, it is it is just a city street. City street. Okay. The reason I bring it up is maybe there's some potential funding there or some enhancements that you know we could look at if that is kind of a, a potential center with bicycles going through there. Mm -hmm. um, but it's very exciting and uh, I think the more we can I do support more going off the main government way, right? Um, to give them that trail feel and I don't know if we, I guess that's parkland that we're getting into further in the north. Is that right? It, it is, yeah. The place where we've got the big switch back is the northwest corner of the dog park. So this would impact part of the dog park. It's the less utilized area. It's where, you know, you can kind of climb up the hill with your dog and go up in the trees and go for a little hike. But there, there would be some impacts there. Yeah, well, I really support as much as getting it off the main roadway as possible. That would be great. Thank you. And I do have a draft survey, um, if anyone's interested in seeing that. I did put that together thinking that we would probably try to get it out in the next week or so. Can you send that to us, yes. us and the South Hill um, Council members as well? Because we kind of share this area and we've got a West Hills neighborhood meeting coming up. Are you I, perhaps going to talk to them? I don't have it live yet, but I can kind of scroll through and show you what it looks like. It's actually tomorrow. <laughs> so I don't know if we'll do that quick. Can, can you see it? Is it showing up? Yeah. yeah. Well, we could let them know it's coming and maybe they could distribute it on their email if you want to connect with the chair. Okay. So if I understood this right, Ignat, um, what we're talking about is what you want to know is how we feel about taking it down to the two um, possibilities and then doing some more community outreach. Is that correct? Yes. So taking it down to red and blue versus okay. just moving forward only with red. Um, yeah, I would take, I mean, I think it would be good to take it to red and blue and then to go out and have those um, discussions um, to get a little more community input or send a survey out or, or however you're planning it. That would just be my mm -hmm. My thinking is that we can, as much as possible, not surprise people. That's not always 100%. Um, 
Um, you know, that doesn't always work 100% of the time, but I think anytime we can get that information out with that, with the two, um, you're going to have more concise conversations. So that would be my, those are my thoughts on it. Anybody else? Yes, Candace? Candace is giving us the thumbs up. She likes this. And Council yeah. President and I was gonna has say the thumbs same thing. up too. Okay. Digna, do you have or do you have anything else? No, that's that's what I needed. This was great. Thank you so much. Okay, right, thank you. And, um, we appreciate your time. Thanks. Okay, Annika. Is Annika available to talk about the sidewalk bike parking arts? Yes, I am. Take it away. We got you down for 10 minutes. If you could stay yes. on track or maybe finish a little early, that would be much appreciated. I will finish early. I promise. Here we go. Okay, right. so I'm here to talk about the sidewalk and bicycle parking art. And... Um, so some of the background and history. So this was previously part of development services and the Office of um, Neighborhood Services is assuming administration of the program and we're broadening its scope to include bike parking and bike corrals. And so uh, we're working with Colin Quinhurst of Planning and Spokane Arts about testing a mural um, in one of the bike corral locations on Main between Division and Brown uh, and that's kind of by the Saranac and uh, Boots Bakery. So the top image is what it currently looks like and the bottom image is the type of mural that we're going for. And so in looking at the policy that Development Services has put together so far, um, applicants, so businesses, nonprofits, or the city would submit locations and uh, design pitches to Spokane Arts and the city and Spokane Arts would approve or deny the design. And then the onus of soliciting approval from adjacent properties and businesses, um, in addition to maintenance and installation, would be on the applicant. Paint would be under 150 VOC per environmental standards with a grit additive to provide grip. And there's a high permitting fee plus a bond or revocable license requirement to provide financial cushion in case of a need for code enforcement um, to dispatch immediately if there's like profane graffiti, et cetera. Uh, currently, Development Services, they drafted a sidewalk art policy that we've used as a template um, for this broad proposal. So Autumn Reed worked with uh, engineering and uh, Council Member Burke's former LA. And then, um, you know, they discussed about this license and permitting fee. And we at ONS received the documents um, just a couple of weeks ago, so we're still reviewing everything. Uh, but we did connect with Colin Quinhurst to support broadening this policy to include the bike corrals, which that process had been started with development services. And, sorry, uh, we're connecting with Spokane Arts and we're forming a stakeholder group that we'll meet later this month as well as in May um, to discuss intersection street art, but we'll also continue this discussion of sidewalk and bike parking art. And our desired outcomes, uh, neighborhood beautification, increase the quality and appeal of bicycle parking and sidewalks, neighborhood council engagement, business partnerships, working more closely with Spokane Arts, and growing our art policies. So looking at the future of the separate but similar programs of street intersection murals and neighborhood wall slash building murals. Um, some of the hurdles, though, uh, so under the uh, previous, under developmental development services uh, policy that they were putting together, um, the high per permit fee and the requirement of the bond or revocable license, um, that might be inaccessible to those in the arts community that we'd be trying to um, connect with with this program, so that requires further research. There are some environmental concerns raised with the pollution of the river and the impacts of the paint um, on the environment, and then whether placement could confuse drivers, pedestrians, or bicyclists. Um, but we are working with Shauna Harshman of 
uh, city council staff as well as legal with some of those um, uh, some of those pieces and we are really just diving into this program so there's my presentation short and sweet and ready for questions before we do questions Shauna Harshman are you out there Shauna has been working on this as well, so I was going to give her the opportunity to um, provide any additional information. Okay. I don't think she is. Does anybody have questions for Annika? I do. I do. This is Laura. Laura Kinnear. Thanks. Um, I, too, have concerns about uh, licensing and permitting because when I sponsored the streetery and parklet ordinance. That was a big deal to have go through all those hurdles of getting a permit. It was bad enough that it cost money to actually construct the what what it was, but then you have to wait for a permit. You have to have it inspected. There were so many bells and whistles that that was that were needed. It doesn't serve us, I don't think or the arts community to have to go through this. I think we need to really streamline it, make it as easy as possible to get this going. It's, it's not, it, it, it's a very small amount of money that we'd be recouping. So I think we really need to make it as simple as possible and a permit and licensing, not simple. I appreciate those comments. Lori, I think that you you share my I, I share your concerns. I think some of us are a little worried about that. So maybe we can have some discussions on that in the future. Anybody else? Yeah, okay. Council, Council President, I was just going to also say I think as long as Spokane okay. Arts is overseeing it, I don't think we have to worry about those issues. So I, I could imagine if it was someone who just wanted to do it independent of our programming, maybe we need a little more. A surety, but other than that, I agree with uh, making it as easy as possible since it's benefiting the community. And some of the programming we're talking uh -huh. about going forward is the city would actually be uh, contributing uh, the cost of it, so we wouldn't want to eat up those dollars in permitting. So. Councilmember Cathcart? Yeah, just wondering, uh, does any anything in this um, address like temporary art like sidewalk chalk kind of stuff uh, art that's essentially removable just curious on that so I I don't believe what we've been focusing on has that but I will be doing a deeper dive into the policy and I'll let you know anybody else have questions Annika, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate the information. We're going to move now to Michaela to talk about the lease of the five, I always say this wrong, high undies. Did I say that right? Yes. Okay, perfect. Hi, this is Nathan Gro. I'm, I'm stepping in for Michaela and for David Payne, who would otherwise be here except he is sick today. Um, as we've discussed previously, and, and as it states, the parking meter department would like to lease five Kona electric vehicles from Enterprise. Um, those are going to be replacing vehicles, you know, that have reached the economic end of their life, replacing those go-fors that were previously being used. I'd like to just reiterate that the lease option allows the city to terminate at the 13th month should the availability of, of either more efficient and mission effective EVs become available. We chose to go with these vehicles specifically and, and maybe not something smaller uh, because they do need the ability to haul cargo such as car boots. Um, and as well, the Konas do sit higher from the ground and are easier to get in and out of consistently. Um, Discussions have been had on vehicle fit and preference, and we recommend and support the Konas to meet the needs of the department. And as well, there will be development of infrastructure at the intermodal center where these units will be eventually housed. 
in the meantime and until that charging infrastructure, um, which will include security fencing, is in place, the vehicles will be charged and housed at the Nelson Center. We've had a lot of conversations around these um, vehicles, so I'm sure everyone is maybe aware of the situation, but um, does anyone have any new questions? Anybody have questions, Council President? Yep, I just have a comment. Um, thank you for your work, Nathan. As I understood the concept, it's really kind of a year pilot to get our arms around it. Overall, mm -hmm. I think the big advantage on electric vehicles is they last about twice as long as um, gasoline vehicles. And so really where we're going to get the savings is not going to be so much on a lease to lease, but it's when we actually purchase them. So, But if I understand the terms of the agreement we have with enterprises, we can opt out at any time. And uh, if the value of the vehicle went up, we get that money as well. So I'm supportive of the lease for the next year, but I hope that we'll start looking at uh, purchases because that's where we'll save a lot of money because, again, they tend to last twice as long. So it's like getting two vehicles for the price of one. So, But thanks for your work. Of course. Thank you so much. And you are correct, Council President. Anybody else have questions? Nathan, thank you so much for that information. We appreciate it. We're going to move on to Donna to talk about short-term rentals. And there's only one short-term rental presentation. We um, accidentally listed two, but there's only one. And Donna is going to do the, uh, do the presentation. That is correct. OK. Can everyone see that OK? I'm not camera shy. I just have a inoperative audio and camera on my computer, so I'm calling in. So circling back to the short-term rental conversation that we had about a year and a half ago now, um, a little update. And for those that weren't there, some background information. We have been regulating the short-term rentals since May of 2015. The permits are issued through Development Services Center. And then prior to being able to apply, you have to have a business license. And that is through the Washington Department of Revenue. And up until this point, since 2015, we do only have still 126 short-term rentals um, permitted. The revenue we know that we're getting right now um, are from our new permits, which are $150. Our renewals um, are $100 every year. And the business license is $117 a year, but again, that's through Department of Revenue. I've been working with Jake Hensley in accounting, and he sent me um, a summary of what we've been getting sales tax-wise, because it sounds like that was of interest at the last time we talked about this. And it captured only Airbnb and HomeAway, and he was only able to get it in year increments. And so this is just, um, you can get an idea <laughs> of how much we're getting from those. Again, this is only two platforms, though, that are being used. And also take into consideration that this 20 to 21 that year, um, there were certainly not as many rentals as um, we would usually see. So that number is probably going to be much higher next year. So the, the permit fees are stay with the development services and enterprise fund and then all the uh, license fees and taxes go to the general fund. Quick snapshot of how we handle enforcement. Again, we only run on a complaint basis on these. And so um, either Development Services Center will hear about them, taxes and licensing, or code enforcement. Uh, so if we do get a call of a neighbor just concerned about um, a short-term rental, it typically is um, given over to code enforcement and they'll follow up with their standard operation. And the tricky part about these is that the platforms don't give us addresses, so none of those are made public. And so that's why we really only can count on uh, neighborhood complaints on these. So the existing conditions that we know are out there, um, this is just a quick snapshot from a source of a website that we paid a minimal fee for. Um, so we had some more concrete information about um, what's actually going on out there. 
we we know we have about 404 active rentals within the city limits and so again only 126 of those are actually licensed and so that's a little um, problematic and so we unfortunately this particular website again does not give us addresses um, but it actually gives us some information to work off of um, and get, give us an idea of how much how many of these we are missing and so looking into doing an RFP to um, have a compliance software come in and help us get these um, they're able to cross-reference the discovered listings with our permitting system and so they can see whether or not uh, a short-term rental does have a license with us or not. And so when we do put this, or if we do put this RFP out, um, we definitely want to make sure that they are uh, able to be compatible with our system that we use, which is Acela, and that they're able to actually get addresses of these. Otherwise, it makes enforcement really complicated. But we do know that these compliance softwares do exist out there. We've We've met with a few throughout the years that have shown us what they're able to do, and it's, it's super impressive, and there's a bunch of jurisdictions out there that are already using them because um, I think they're running into the same problem as we are. By It's, it's very difficult when the, when the addresses are not uh, publicly displayed on these. And so with the RFP, though, um, knowing what we know as far as, again, if you remember the map, um, a lot of these do exist in the downtown area. And so when we do get the notices out there of um, these that are not compliant, we are anticipating a lot of them to be located in areas where um, short-term rentals actually aren't allowed, which is outside of residential zones. So currently our code only allows them in zones where residential uses are allowed. So that's um, only the residential zones, not your downtown, not your PC zones, not your commercial zones, but we know that people do have houses in those zones, um, and unfortunately, if they did want to do the short-term rental process, we would have to tell them, you need to do a change of use and go through the building department to change your single-family home, essentially, to uh, retail sales and service, which would basically be under the, the use of a hotel motel. So, rather than setting these um, short-term rentals that we know are out there in the non-residential zones up for essentially a, a long road ahead to get just a short-term rental in their house. We want to make sure that we have an avenue to make them successful and give them the avenue to come into compliance, which we were hoping to look into allowing the short-term rentals in all zones where the residential uses are allowed. And with that, though, we understand that there are larger multifamily structures located in the downtown in these um, commercial zones. And so we would want to be mindful of that and making sure they don't have that quick loophole of saying, okay, well, I want to rent out all the units, but not go through, um, you know, essentially a hotel motel process, which would keep a good eye on like health and or safety and building codes. And so we would want to look into uh, putting a cap on the number of units you can rent out on a, in a short term, as a short term rental, and if you want to go beyond the threshold, the avenue for that is just to go through the hotel motel change of use process. And so they still have a path forward if they did want to rent out a whole building, but um, they would need to go through the proper fire building safety codes for that. So um, we talked about working through these alongside with putting the RFP out. Um, it's kind of a Put the chicken before the egg scenario though so we are hoping for a little bit of guidance um, and possibly some some goal setting to figure out where our priorities are and and what we would want to do first but our recommendation is that we do look at these two um, specific code changes before we, we move forward with an RFP God this is Lori hi Lori Thanks so much for doing this. Um, I don't know if you know this, but I worked on the first ordinance when I was uh, staff in the council office. And we worked on it for over a year, did a lot of outreach, and came up with an ordinance that was 
admittedly flawed for the very reasons that you are listing right here. And part of that is we can't identify where these places are. I remember, too, working with the restaurant and uh, the hospitality industry, and they were very adamant that these, these folks are in direct competition with the hotels. And they wanted to make sure that all of the, the restrictions or laws or licenses or anything that hotels had to go through, the uh, short-term rentals had to go through as well. Just fair is fair. Level playing field. Because they, they, were at an, uh, they felt they were at an unfair advantage. And I think this is the time where we can look a little bit more deeply at is this a level, level playing field for... Um, the hotel industry and the restaurant, it, it affects restaurant industry as well, but is this a level playing field or are short-term rentals still being given an advantage um, in the way they're taxed, licensing, everything? So I would urge us to look at this with a little bit of a deeper dive to make sure that we're, we're being fair across the board. And I can tell you that I think that 400 number is probably low, and given a in a year not um, outside of COVID, let's say, um, it's probably much higher, and we're not capturing that. So I, I urge us to capture that. I also urge us to take another look at all the requirements that we're asking of the short-term rentals, and that they're an equivalent with the hotel and restaurant industry. And I, I will say we do we do know that um, the because the way the tax part of it works is they quarterly it, it's for at least Airbnb and HomeAway those two platforms quarterly those platforms report the sales tax and all that tax um, information to the Department of Revenue and then the Department of Revenue uh, then sends that cut to the City of Spokane. And so we, we are getting the transient taxes and sales tax for those that um, are going through Airbnb and HomeAway. The, the complicated part is that the Department of Revenue, from my conversations with them, have said they, they don't look to match it to any particular business license. So they're essentially just taking this money from Airbnb, seeing that it's in the city of Spokane city limits, and then gives the city their cut. So... The city at this point is not necessarily being shorted those taxes or the sales tax. They're being shorted the business license fee and the permitting fees. And so Jake, Jake Hensley, again, in accounting, unfortunately, he can't be here today. Um, he's off this week. He, he has helped me get those numbers, and um, it is clear that they are, they are getting those tax funds from Airbnb, which is the more heavily used platform. Um, that we can that we can see, and and getting those to the city of Spokane. Well, there are other there are other fees and regulations that aren't being considered, not just sales tax. And I'd be glad to talk with you offline about it as well. Right. Yes, definitely a lot of other regulations for sure. Council President, and then uh, Council Member Cathcart. Yeah, I just wanted to weigh in on your question of sequencing, and I strongly believe we should get the data as soon as possible. Uh, that will inform the other things. I think we can start working on the um, ordinance updates based on our experience, but we need the data. There's a, a lot of things that we probably are going to need to adjust that we need to know the location. So I would say full speed ahead on getting the data. It'll pay for itself um, and then we'll know what we're actually dealing with. So thanks. Council Member Cathcart. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Donna, thank you for the, the presentation. I, I guess I'm just a little confused. I, what is it exactly that we're trying to, what, what's the activity that we don't like that we're trying to stop or slow or, or change? I mean, are we getting an outsized number of calls of, of service for police presence at Airbnbs for fire? What's the impact that they're adding to the community that we otherwise wouldn't see that we have to charge them for? And are we also going to also regulate 
uh, like house sitting. I mean, the same impact, same exact thing. The only difference is perhaps they're not using a, a digital platform. Uh, it might be a friend. It might be a family member. It might just be a stranger. Um, but I don't see necessarily a difference between house sitting and, and renting out your, your unit for a one night or a two night stay. So I, I guess I'm really just trying to understand the bigger picture of what's the activity that we, that is happening right now that we're trying to stop and prohibit, uh, or slow down. And then, um, are there other aspects of this that we're also going to regulate? So there's nothing as far as short-term rentals that we're trying to prohibit. We really have not had seen, we have not seen a negative impact to the neighborhoods. Um, I always ask when folks renew how it's going and they say it's going great. For the most part, they, everything's been really respectful as far as these folks who are hosting. It's the concern is just the folks that aren't getting them permitted. And so it's a very simple process to get them permitted. Really all we're doing is looking for the documentation that it is a, a legal home um, and that, you know, they're not renting out a garage or an illegal unit of any kind. So there's that uh, sense of safety there. And our other concern is that they, you know, we, we know these exist in non-residential zones and we, we will, Part of the code change that we are hoping to, to work on is to allow them to be able to apply for a short-term rental license. Because as of right now, technically they should be going through a change of use process to be a hotel motel. And that's pretty burdensome for a homeowner who, whose house just happens to be in the centers and corridor zone or a commercial zone. And so we want to set them up to where they're able to take advantage of this code just like a uh, any other homeowner. Um, so that's kind of why we're exploring opening it up to more zones, but there's really not a nuisance issue to be honest. Well, I guess the only other thing I would, I would add is, is, uh, uh, particularly for those who are, are simply renting out their, their home on a very occasional basis, maybe trying to make a little bit of extra money to survive. I mean, we are in the middle of a pandemic right now. Uh, I just, you know, is it fair to punish them? I mean, I understand a business license that makes total sense to me. But the, the additional fees on top of that, I mean, I don't, and I disagree. I don't think it is the same as a hotel motel. There's a very uh, different level of service between the two. So I'm not sure you can compare them apples to apples. And so business license makes sense. You know, having a, a list to, to track where they are makes sense. But I think beyond that, just this prohibition on, on folks or, or this, this making it difficult for people who are trying to make a little bit of extra money to do so, I, I'm just not sure I agree with that. So we are running out of time and we still have a couple more brief presentations. Um, what I'm going to suggest is if you want more information that you go ahead and send um, an email to Donna and then possibly council president as we move forward, um, this might be a topic for a study session when we get all the pieces in place to have a better discussion. Council member mom quickly. Yes, very quickly, I just want to add some other information. I know Council um, Member Stratton and I have received complaints and concerns. It is not, you know, and we'd be happy to pass those on to you, Donna, so you understand we've got parking issues, we've got partying issues, um, we've got young people using these and causing problems in our neighborhoods that we've taken complaints about. Also, um, I want to point out we have a loophole in the cottage housing um, designation for residential, that potentially 10 of these could all be Airbnbs or another one and basically turn it into a motel, which would have needs for cleaning and staff, and this came up in West Central. So uh, the, I fully support uh, going with a professional agency. Other cities do this. It is not the same as housing or house sitting, absolutely not. It is a business and should be treated as such, and this is how other cities are dealing with it. So I look forward to the study session on this. We need to help our citizens make money, but also have a safe place to house people so it is up to code. Yes, please send me any, um, if you do continue to get complaints, feel free to forward those directly to me and we'll, we'll get taken care of. Okay, great. And if people have additional questions, Donna, they can email you and then we can work together, um, move forward and possibly have a better discussion at a study session, okay? Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. We're moving right along with um, George Dahl, Community Block Grant Fund, CARES Act. Yeah, hi everyone. Um, so this is just a simple briefing for city council to let you all know that 
the Community Housing and Human Services Department is going to be applying for a grant through the Washington State Department of Commerce. So the Washington State Department of Commerce receives a Community Development Block Grant through the Department of Housing and Urban Development, just as the City of Spokane does. And what they're doing is they're passing through some of those funds. So um, we're looking at $445,201 that we're uh, eligible for. We're looking at rolling those funds into rental assistance, utility assistance, mortgage assistance, and then operational support for our partner agencies to help with cultural navigation for, for folks that are seeking out some of that assistance. Um, on page 161, uh, 162, 163 of your agenda packet has this um, project charter um, that I'm presenting right now. I want to just scroll down right here to the timeline so you all are aware. Today we're doing a briefing to let you know our intent to apply. Um, and then the application will close with the Department of Commerce on Friday, April 30th. Following that, Commerce will let us know whether or not we receive our award. Uh, then we'll go into contracting um, and we'll have until June 30th of 2023 to expend these funds. We're looking to pair them with some of our other uh, rental assistance funds that are being um, passed through the Community Housing and Human Services Department um, so that we can help in uh, community response to coronavirus. So that's, that's everything that I had to share with you all. Do you have any questions? First, George, it's, here to, it's good to hear your voice. <laughs> I haven't heard it in a while. Um, anybody have questions for George? If you have questions, I would recommend uh, George is very good about responding, so send him an email. I also am going to ask Melissa Morrison to send out an email update on the um, pop-up shelters discussions we've been having um, over the last few weeks. And Chris Becker, you would be our last person to um, present building to permit construction updates. Is that something that can be done quickly? I can be so quick. You're on. All right. So um, we've, we're busy down in the DSC. Um, even though the total number of permits has not um, changed compared to 2020, um, our valuations are up significantly and our single family uh, permitting is up. Um, we issue, have issued 114 uh, home so far this year. We have um, another 92 where the plan review is complete and just and uh, basically waiting for uh, fees to be paid before we're ready to issue in, um, another 84 homes um, in plan review right now. Um, I also wanted to point out that um, our online permits, uh, you can see uh, you're seeing an uptick there. We're opening up the online permitting even more than we have. Um, and doing additional um, improvements to our system uh, so that we remove, we're removing the uh, requirement that you be a licensed contractor to pull some of our electrical uh, plumbing or trade permits. Uh, so at, at the end of March, we were at $196 million total valuation. Um, this is the breakdown by project size. You can see that we've had several um, large projects that were issued. We um, issued permits for the uh, Northeast or Northwest Middle School, uh, 40, uh, $43 million for that, and Selkirk Pharma out on the West Plains with $36 million. Um, public, publicly funded projects, we have 51 million of that 196. That was the middle school. That is also some of the Central City Line work for STA. Uh, that, this is the single family permits, 114 so far this year. Um, and, we, and when you add up everything that's in plan review, plan review has been approved in the 114, we're at about 290 through the end of March. And they keep coming in. Um, this is multifamily and this is not correct. We had a little glitch with our uh, permit system and I was checking it this morning. We're at about 299 units. And that includes brand new units and um, a change of use. So we've had a couple, about three change of use projects where we've added um, units. So it's about 299 so far this year. Um, and we still have several large projects uh, coming, as we'll see. 
Um, this is the one that I only update once a year. So the largest projects, we, like I said, we have the Northwest Middle School, the Selkirk Pharma, uh, Riverbend. We have the first uh, phase of that. There's a second phase that's in plan review. Um, the 508 building was, a, was that change of use at 508 West 6th. That was 118 units. Um, and then uh, some of the other smaller projects. Uh, these are the largest projects in plan review. Radio Park Apartments up off of Regal. Uh, that is 153 units. 206 West Riverside is about 140 units. Um, we have Joe Albee uh, still in review, uh, Spokane International Academy, and the Uprise Brewery. And then um, the largest projects uh, that are coming through our pre dev system right now um, include a new uh, Assisted Living and Memory Care Facility, that's up on um, Regal. That's just information wasn't mm -hmm. in the permit system that the Power BI is pulling from. Um, Mother Teresa Haven uh, over by SFCC. Um, and then a Maverick Convenience Store, that one's um, out there on Trent. Uh, and then I can, I will, uh, Autumn will send you the link to the Power BI so you can go through and click on each of these dots. Um, if you want to, and I think that is my last slide. Anybody have questions for Chris? I, I don't have, President? I don't have a question, but I just wanted to note since we're out of time that we're on the uh, source of income discrimination. We're not doing anything on that uh, right away. So we'll talk about that at a study session or an upcoming committee. So I just wanted people not to worry about that, but we'll get to that. So thanks. Thanks for bringing that up. Okay, everybody, we'll see you at 3.30. Thank you for your patience and your participation today, and we'll see you soon.